Hello, Booktube. It's time for Chapter 4 of A. Edward Newton's The Amenities of Book Collecting and Kindred Affections. It was originally published uh, in 1918. My copy is 1920. Um, it's a British edition of John Lane, The Bodily Head. And the Chapter 4 is entitled Association, in quotation marks, Books and First Editions. And it, it goes... No books have appreciated more in value than presentation or association volumes, and as and the reason is not far to seek. Of any given copy, there can hardly be a du duplicate. For the most part, presentation copies are first editions plus. Frequently, there is a note or a comment which sheds biographical light on the author. In the slightest ins inscription, there is the record of the friendship by means of which we get back of the book to the writer. The speaking of association books, and speaking of association books, everyone will remember the story that General Wolf, Wolf in an open boat in the St. Lawrence as he was being rowed down the stream to the point just below Quebec, reciting the lines from Gray's Elegy. The boast of heraldy, the pomp of prow, and all that beauty, all that wealth e'er gave, Await alike the inevitable hour, the paths of glory led but to the grave. Adding, I would rather be the author of that piece than have the honor of boat beating the French tomorrow. When Wolfe left England, he carried with him a copy of the Elegy, the gift of his fiancée, Miss Catherine Lather. He learned the poem by heart. He underscored his favorite lines, among them the passages quoted. He filled the book with notes. After his death, the book and a miniature of the lady were returned to her, and only a few days ago this book, a priceless volume of unique association interest, was offered for sale. The first man who saw it bought it. He had never bought a fine book before, but he could not resist this one. When I learned of the transaction, I was grieved and delighted, grieved that uh, so wonderful a vo volume had escaped me, delighted that I had not been subject to so terrible a temptation. What was the price of it? Only the seller and the buyer know, know and I fancy some gilt-edged securities had to be parted with. How the prices of these books go uh, soaring is shown by the continuous advice advance on the price of a copy of Shelley's Queen Mab. It is a notable copy referred to in Dowden's Life of Shelley. On the flyleaf uh, is an inscription to Shelley's hand. Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin from PBS. Inside of the back cover, Shelley has written in pencil, You see, Mary, I have not forgotten you. And elsewhere in the book, in Mary's hand, we read, This book is sacred to me, and it has no other uh, creature shall ever look into it. I may write in it what I please, yet what shall I write? That I love the author beyond all powers of expression, and that I am powdered, parted from him and much more in the same effect in the Ive Sale, in, and much more to that effect. In the Ive Sale in 1891, this volume of supreme interest bought $190. In 1897, at the Fredrickson sale, it brought 615 And a year ago, the dealer sold it for 7500 and cheap at, at that. I say, for where will it find another? I have before me a copy of Stevenson's Inland Voyage, pamphlets aside, which by reason of their manner of publication are now rare. It may be said to be the author's first book. It has an inscription, My dear Cummy, if you had not taken so much trouble with me all those years of my childhood, this book would never have been written. Many a long night you sat up with me when I was ill. I wish I hope by way of return to amuse a single, e single evening for you with my little book. But whatever you may think of it, I know you will continue to think kindly of the author. And there's the inscription he shows there. My facsimile. Uh, but whatever you... Yeah, I think... Uh, I thought when I gave $400 for it, uh, that I was paying a fabulous price, but as I have since been offered twice that sum, Rosenbach evidently led me 
uh, let me have a bargain. He tells me that it was good business sometimes to sell a book for less than it is worth. He regards it as bait. He angles for you very skillfully, does Rosie, and lands you, me, every time. A, child gardens, a Child's Garden of Verses is another book which was doubled in value two or three times in the last few years. Gabriel Wells now offering a copy with a brief inscription for $300, having sold me not long before for twice this sum, a copy in which Stevenson's writing is mingled with the type of the title page, and it reads, Robert Louis Stevenson, his copy of A Child's Garden of Verses, and if it, it is in the hands of anyone else, explain it uh, who can, but not by the gift of Robert Louis Stevenson. And there's the uh, title page. That Stevenson afterward changed his mind and gave it to E.F. Russell with heart, hearty goodwill is shown by another inscription. This copy was purchased at the sale for the British Red Cross in London shortly after the outbreak of the war. It may be some time before it is worth what I paid for it, uh, or the price may look cheaper tomorrow. Who shall say? Watching the quotations of the first editions of Steve Stevenson is rather like looking at the quotations of stock markets you haven't got, as they recover from a panic. A point or two a day is added to their prices, but Stevenson's more five or ten points at a time, and there has been no reaction as yet. Only a year or two ago I paid Drake fifty pounds for a copy of the new Abrian, uh, uh, Arabian Nights, and a few days ago I saw in his papers that a copy had just been sold for fifty pounds in the London auction room. I cannot quite understand Stevenson's immense vogue. Perhaps it is his rare personality of the man. Try as we may, it is impossible to separate the personality of the man from his work. Why is one author collected and another not? I do not know. Practically no other, no one collects Scott or George Eliot or Trollope. But Trollope collectors, uh, there there will be, and the uh, MacDermots of Ballacorn and the Kellys and the O'Kellys will bring fabulous prices some of, uh, some of these days. Five hundred dollars each, more a thousand, I should say. And then, and when you pay this sum, look well for the errors in pagination and see what Mortimer Street is spelt Morimer in the title page of volume three of the former. And remember, too, that this book is so rare that there is no copy of it in the British Museum. At least now, I am told, but you will find one on my shelves in a corner every over there, together with everything else this great Victorian has written. Of all novelists of my... Uh, my favorite Trollope uh, proved uh, the correctness of Johnson's remark. A man may write as at any time if he will set himself doggedly at it. This we know Trollope did. We have his word for it. His personality was too sane, too matter of fact to be attractive. But his books are delightful. One doesn't read Trollope as Coleridge and Shakespeare, but flashes of lightning that's that that isn't uh isn't right but it expresses the idea but there is a good steady glow emanating from the author himself which once you get accustomed to it will enable you to see the whole group of mid-victorian characters so perfectly that you come to know them as well as the members of your own family and i sometimes think uh, understand them better but for one collector who expresses a mild interest in Trollope, there are a thousand who regard the brave invalid who, little more than twenty years ago, passed away uh, on the lonely Salmon Island in the Pacific as one of the greatest of the moderns, as certainly as certain of immortality uh, as as Charles Lamb. They may be right. This little boy, this little toy books and leaflets. Whose, his little toy books and leaflets, those which the author and the printer, and with various kinds of skill, uh, concocted in the winter and at Davos on the hill, and elsewhere are simply invaluable. The author and the printer are one and the same. R.L.S. Robert Louis Stevenson, 
uh, assisted or perhaps hindered by S.L.O., Mrs. Stevenson's son, uh, then a lad. Of these Stevensons, Penny Whistles is the rarest, but two copies are known. One in the private collection in England, the other was brought uh, at the Borden sale in 1913 by Mrs. Widener for $2,500 $2, in order to compete uh, as far as might be the Stevens complete as far as uh, might be the Stevenson collection now in the Widener Memorial Library. It was a privately printed forerunner of a child's garden of verses published several years later. It is a far cry from these bijou, the, those, these bijou to Stevenson's regularly published volumes, but when it is remembered that these later are printed in fairly large editions and relatively only a few years ago, it will be seen that the other author of yesterday fetches much higher prices as Stevenson. In recent years, there, were, uh, there have been published a number of bibliographies without which no collector can be expected to keep house. To be indebted to the Groyer Cub for some of the uh, best of these, its members have the books and are the most generous in ex exhibiting them, and it must indeed be a churlish scholar who cannot freely uh, ex secure access to the collections of its members. Aside from these three volumes entitled Contributions to English Bibliography, published and sold by the club, the handbooks of the exhibitions held from time to time are much sought for the wealth of information they contain. The club's librarian, Miss Ruth S. Granis, uh, worked in cooperation with its uh, with the members, is simply responsible f is largely responsible for the skill and intelligence with which these little catalogues are compiled. The time and amount of painstaking research which enter into the making of them is simply enormous. Indeed, no one quite understands the many questions which arise to vex the bibliographer unless they have attempted to make for themselves even the simplest form of catalogue. Over the door of the room in which they work should be inscribed the text Be your, be sure your sin will be be sure your sin will find you out. Some blunders are redeemed by the laughter they arise. Here is a famous one. Shelley Prometheus, Unbound, etc. Uh, Shelley, Prometheus, Bound in all of Morocco, etc. But the, uh, but for the first part, the lot of the bibliographer, as Dr. Johnson said, of the dictionary maker, is to be exposed to censure without hope of praise. That Oscar Wilde continues to interest the collector is proved, if proof were necessary, by the uh, splendid bibliography by Stuart Mance Mason in two large volumes. Its editor tells us that it is the work of ten years, which I can readily believe, and Robert Ross Wide's literary executor says in the introduction that it is turning over the proof for ten minutes. He learned more about uh, Wilde's writings than Wilde himself ever knew. It, it gave me some pleasure when I first took the book up to see that Mason had used for his frontispiece the caricature of Wild by Aubrey Beardsley. Uh, this original, the original of which now hangs on the wall near my writing table, together with the letter from Ross, in which he says, from a technical point of view, this drawing is interesting as showing the artistic development of what afterwards was called the Japanese method in the salami draw salami. Uh, Salome uh, drawings. Uh, here is here it is only an embryo, and this in the earliest drawing I remember in which the use of dotted lines, a peculiar Beardsley, can be traced. Uh, another favorite bibliography is that of Dickens by John C. Eccel. His first editions of Charles Dickens is a book which no lover of Dickens and who is not can be without. It is a book to be read as well as a book of reference. In it, Mr. Eckel does one thing, however, which is, from its very nature, hopeless and discouraging. He attempts to indicate the prices of which first editions of this favorite author can be secured at auctions or from dealers in London and this country. Alas, alas, while waiting to secure prizes at Eckel's prices, I have been then soaring 
Uh, they, I have seen them soaring in figures undressed, undreamed of for a few years ago. In his chapter, the presentation copies, he refers to a copy of Bleak House given by Dickens to Dudley Co Costello. Some years ago, he says, it sold for $150. 18 months later, the collector resold the book to the dealer for $380, who made a quick turn and sold the book for 10% in advance, uh, or $418. These figures Mr. Echo considers astonishing. I now own the book, but it came into my possession at a figure considerably in excess of that name. A copy of American Notes with an inscription Thomas Carlyle from Charles Dickens, uh, 19 October 1842, gives it an excellent idea of the rise in the price of a book, interesting itself and on account of its inscription. At auction in London in 1902, it sold for £43. After passing through the hands of several dealers, it was purchased by A.E. Alice in Milwaukee and at a sale for his books in New York in 1912, it brought by, by George D. Smith for $1,050. Smith passed the book to Edwin W. Cogshill, but its history is not yet at an end. For at his sale on April 25, 1916, it is bought by the firm of Dutton for $1,850 and, and by then passed on the story goes to a discriminating collector in Detroit, a man who can call all the parts, can call all the parts of an automobile by name. Um, but unfortunately, while his book was in full flight, it secured. I secured a copy with the inscription W. C. McCready from his friend Charles Dickens, 18th of October, 1842. Now, what is my copy worth? Seven years ago, I paid Charles Sessler $900 for three books, a presentation carol to Tom Beard, a cricket, to McCready and his haunted man, to McLeese at the Cogs Hall sale. A dealer paid $1,000 for carol, while I gave Smith 10% advance on the $1,000 for the uh, chimes with an inscription, Charles Dickens, Jr., from his affectionate father, Charles Dickens. This copy at the Alice sale had bought $775, at, at which time I was prepared to pay $5 for it. I always returned from all these all-star performances depressed in spirit and shattered in pocket. Where will it stop? I say to myself, when will it stop? My wife says to me, and both questions remain unanswered certainly not while well. presentation dickenses can be had and are lacking from all for my collection i now possess 21 and it is with presentation dickenses as with elephants a good many uh, go to uh, go to the dozen but i lack and sadly want shall i give a list no the prices are going up fast without uh, enough without stimulation for me Wait until my wants are complete, then let joy be unconfined. A final word on Dickens. The price, uh, prices are skyrocketing because everyone loves him. Age cannot wither nor custom stale his infinite variety. As a great creative genius, he ranks with Shakespeare. He has given pleasure to millions. He has been translated into all languages of Europe. Pickwick, it is said... Uh, stands forth in circulation among English printed books, being exceeded only by the Bible, Shakespeare, and the English prayer book. And the marvel is that when Dickens is spoken of, it is, it is difficult to arrive at an agreement as to which is his greatest book. But these, this paper is supposed to relate to prices rather than to books themselves. Other seductive arguments having failed, one sometimes hears a vendor of rare books add it is in his most convincing manner that you couldn't possibly make a better investment. The idea, I suppose, is calculated to enable a man to meet his wife's reproachful uh, glance or something uh, worse if he returns home with the book under his arm. But when one is about to commit some piece of extravagance, such as buying a book for which one already has several copies one will grasp at any straw and more as so 
as there may be some truth in the statement. There are, however, uh, so many good reasons why we should buy rare books, and it seems a pity over uh, ever to refer to the uh, least of them. I am not sure that I am called on to give any judgment to the matter, but my belief is that the one best and sufficient reason for a man to buy a book is because he thinks he will be happier with it than without it. I always question myself at this point and another which possesses it, uh, presses it closely. Can I pay for it? I confess that I do not always listen to the attentively, uh, so attentively for the answer to the second question, but I try to live as to the be able to look my bookseller in the eye and tell him where to go. I govern myself by a few rules, but this is one of them, never to allow a book to enter my library as a creditor. Uh, un, un livre est un ami qua ne change jamais. I want to enjoy my friends whenever I am with them. One would get very tired of a friend every time one met him. He should suggest a touch or fifty or five hundred dollars on the shelves uh, in my office are some books which are mine some in which there is at the moment a joint ownership and some which will be mine in the near future i hope with doubtless uh, and doubtless in this hope i am not alone but the books on the shelves uh, around me around the room in which i write are mine all mine the advance given by punch to those about to marry don't seems then to be the best advice for a man who is tempted to buy a book uh, by the hope of making a profit out of his books but i observe that this short and ugly word deters very few from the following their inclinations in the matter of marriage and this advice may fall as advice as usually falls on deaf ears only when a man is safely ensconced in six feet of earth with several tons of exulting granite upon his chest, is he in a position to give advice with any certainty, and when, and then he is silent. But it will nevertheless be understood that I do not recommend the purchase of rare books as an investment, and this in spite of the fact that many collectors have made handsome profits out of the books they have sold. While a man may do much worse th with his money than buy rare books, he cannot be certain that he can dispose of them at a profit, nor is it, is, is it necessary that he should do so. He should be satisfied to eat his cake and have it. Books selected with any judgment will almost certainly afford this satisfaction, and of that other hobby, of, and of what other hobby can this be said with the same assurance? The possession of rare books is the delight best understood by the uh, by the owners of them. They are not called upon to explain. They, the gentle will understand, and the savage may be disregarded. It is the scholar whose sword is usually brandished against collectors, and I w would not have him think that in addition um, to our little uh, being ignorant of our books, we are speculators in them also let us remember that we have our uses on our men the books assume the care as eunuchs our guardians of the fair it may as well be admitted that we do not buy expensive books to read we may say that it is the delight of us to to look upon the large uh, the very page in which appeared for the first time such a sonnet as on first looking into chapman's homer or to read that bit of realism unsurpassed where Robinson Crusoe one day, about noon, discovered the print of a man's naked foot upon the sand. But when we sit down with a copy of Keats, we do not ask uh, for a first edition, much less when we want to live over again the joys of our childhood. Do we pick up a copy of Defoe, which would be uh, a find at a thousand pounds? But first editions of Keats' poems, 1817, in boards, with the paper labeled, if possible, and Defoe unwashed in a sound old calf binding, are good things to have. They are indeed a joy forever and will never pass into nothingness. I cannot see why the possession of fine books is more reprehensible than the possession of valuable property 
of any other sort. And speaking of books as an investment, one implies first editions. First editions are scarce. Tenth editions, as Charles Lamb's uh, stutteringly suggested, are scarcer. But there is no demand for them. Why, then, first editions? The question is usually dodged, and the truth may well be stated. There is a joy in a mere ownership. It may be silly or it may be selfish, but it is a joy uh, akin to that of possessing land, which seems to need no defense. We do not walk over our property every day. We frequently do not you see it, but when the fancy takes us, we love to forget our cares and responsibilities in a ramble over our fields. In like manner, and for the same reason we borrow, we browse with delight in the corner of our library, in which we have placed our books of our most precious books. We should buy our books as we buy our clothes, not only to cover our nakedness, but to embellish us, uh, and we should buy more books and fewer clothes. I am, to, I am told that in proportion to our numbers and our wealth, less money is spent on books now than is, was ever spent 50 years ago. I suppose our growing love of sport is to some extent responsible. Golf has taken the place of books. I know that it takes time and costs money. I do not play the game myself, but I have a son who does. Perhaps when I am his age, I should, uh, f uh, perhaps when I am his age, I shall feel that I can afford it. My sport is book hunting. I look upon it as a game, a game requiring skill, some money, and luck. The pleasure that comes from seeing some book in a catalog priced at ten or three times what I have paid for a copy is a pleasure due to a vindicated judgment. I do not wish to rush into the market and sell and secure my profit. What is profit if I lose my book? Would it, uh, moreover, if one thinks of profit rather than books, there is an interest charge to be considered. A book for which I paid a thousand dollars a few years ago no longer stands me at a thousand dollars, but a considerable greater sum. A man neat at figures could tell with mathematical accuracy just the actual cost of that book down to any given moment. I neither know nor want to know. There is another class of collector with whom I am not in keen sympathy, and that is the men who specialize in in the first published volumes of some given group of authors. These works are usually of relatively little merit, but they are uh, scarce and ex expensive. Um, scarce because published in small edition, and at uh, first neglected, expensive, because they are desired to be complete sets of first editions. Anthony Trollope's first two novels have a greater money value than all the rest of his books put together, but they are hard to read. In like manner, a sensational novel, despite remedies by Hardy, his first venture in fiction, is worth perhaps as much as 50 copies of his Woodlanders one of the best novels of the last half century. George Gissing, when he was walking our streets penniless and in rags, could never have supposed that a few years later his first novel, Workers in the Dawn, should sell for $150, but it has done so. I have a friend who just paid this price. Just here I would like to remark that for several years I have been seeking, without success, a copy of the first edition of the very remarkable book Samuel Butler's The Way of All Flesh. Booksellers who jauntily advise any book uh, got will uh, please make a note of this one, nor do I think it necessary to have other, uh, uh, every scrap, every whiff and trace of any author, however much I may esteem him. My collection of Johnson is fairly complete, but I have no copy of Father Lobo's Abyssinia. It was an early piece of hack work, a translation from the French for which Johnson received five pounds. It is not scarce. One would ha uh, hardly want to read it. It was the recollection of a book, uh, recollection of this book, doubtless that suggested the Prince of Abyssinia to Johnson years later when he wanted to write fiction so that dear old ladies in Cranford called Rasalis. But it is never but it has never seemed necessary 
to my happiness to have a copy of Lobo. On the other hand, I have stocked um, Rasselas pretty considerably and could supply any reasonable demand. Such are the vagaries of collecting. Only once, I think, have I been guilty of buying a book I did not particularly want because of its uh, speculative value. Uh, that has, that was when I stumbled across a copy of Woodrow Wilson's Constitutional Government in the United States with a long inscription to another author's, to its author's uh, cursive hand. Even in this case, I think it was my imagination rather than avarice that led me to pay a fancy price for a book someday uh, when I am not among those present will fetch as many thousands as I paid hundreds. In 1909, when the inscription was written, an author was a relatively unimportant man. Today, uh, he is known throughout the world and is a position of influence. It, its destinies as no other man has ever been. No paper dealing with the prices of books would be complete without a remark that condition is everything. Any rare book is immensely more valuable if in very fine condition. Imagine for the moment a book worth, say, $600 in any condition, for example, The Vicar of Wakefield, and then imagine, if you can, a copy of this same book in boards uncut. Would uh, $2,500 be too high for a price for such a copy? I think not. Another point to be remembered is that the price of a book depends not only on its scarcity, but also on its universality of the demand for it. And once again, I may take The Vicar as an example of what I mean. The Vicar is not a scarce book. Far from uh, six to 800 copies, dependent upon condition, one could, I think, say, lay his hands on as many as 10 copies in, any many, in as many weeks. It is what uh, the trade call a bread and butter book, a staple. There is always a, th a demand for it and always a supply f at a price. But try to get a copy of Fanny Burney's Avelina, and you may have to wait a year or more for it. It was the first book of an unknown young lady. The first edition was very small. It was printed on poor paper, provided to be immensely popular, and was immediately worn out in the reading. But there is no persistent demand for it as there is for the vicar, and it costs only half as much. In reading over whatever I have written on the subject of the prices of rare books, I am aware that my remarks may sound to some like a whistle, a whistle to keep up my courage in the thought of the prices I am paying. But so long as the knockout does not get any uh, get a foretell foothold in this country, and it would immediately be the subject of investigation if it did, and be stopped as uh, other uh, abuses have been. The prices of really good, bo great books will always average higher and higher. If the making of my books, there is no end, nor is there any end to the prices men will be willing to pay for them. So there ends of, uh, chapter 4 of the uh, amenities of book collecting. And that was entitled association books and first editions so our next chapter will be chapter five as we continue through a edward uh newton's the amenities of book collecting and oh do check out uh amy's um uh at the dusty bookshelf she is reading uh a edward newton's uh the um uh, uh, this book selling game um, she's reading uh, it full as well, but an alternate days that I am. So it'll be a uh, nice mix. This is his Edward Newton's first book, and she's reading his third book. Anyway, take care of book two. Bye.